Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to Mysteries from Beyond the Other Dominion. I'm your host, Dr. Franklin Rule, and today we're going to ask if the Yeti is man, beast, or alien. Present evidence of life throughout the universe, investigate the Igbo tribe of Africa, which claims to have evidence of reincarnation, and probe the mysterious disappearance of Judge Joseph Crater, and cover other intriguing subjects. But first, the trivia question of the day. Let me extricate it here from its paper prison. The question, what do they call the Yeti or abominable snowman down under in Australia? Now the prize, the only prize is one pat on the back that you'll have to administer to yourself if and only if you have the correct answer. I'll take a sip of water and be back momentarily. Time is up. Now, in the Himalayas, the Yeti is also known as the Mato. In Russia, he's known as the Kaptar or Almasti. Down in Africa, he's called the Euphidi or Pongo. In the Pacific Northwest of the United States, he's called Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And down under, in Australia, he's known as the Yowie. That's Y-O-W-I-E for those of you taking notes. Now, for hundreds of years, the locals in the Himalayas have described a man-beast that stands anywhere from eight feet in height to 12 feet, weighs 300 to 500 pounds, and has reddish, brownish, or blackish fur. He's said to live in the forest and forage off of moss and lichen under the snow. In 1899, the first Westerner saw evidence of the Yeti. He's a British military officer in Sakim at an altitude of 17,000 feet. He saw a footprint three times the size of a humanoid footprint. Now, what is he? Conceivably, he's just an ordinary mountain ape that legends have been built up around. Nothing more than that. Another possibility is that he's a throwback to a prehistoric creature known as Gigantopithecus, affectionately also called Giganto. He stood 10 feet tall based on skeletal remains, and perhaps his ancestors are still roaming the Himalayas. Another possibility that he's another type of man who evolved contemporaneously with humans, but has been hiding in the highlands of the Himalayas. One theory is that he might actually be the true Homo sapiens, that he's really more intelligent than we are, that he's simply hiding out there, waiting for us to destroy ourselves, at which time he will descend and assume dominance on planet Earth. And yet another theory is that the Yeti is an alien being. Indeed, one candidate, a neighbor of ours, is Mars, which has a thin atmosphere and cold temperature. Conceivably, the Yeti is a Martian entity. But I've given you the evidence. You decide. Is the Yeti man, beast, or alien? And next up, evidence for life throughout the universe. As you may know, it is my thesis, my contention, that we're not alone in the universe. And probably the most substantial proof for that is the so-called statistical evidence. Yeah. 
Our Milky Way galaxy contains an incredible 400 billion stars, and it's just one galaxy among 100 billion others. It's a spiral galaxy, a common type. Other galaxies include so-called elliptical galaxies, irregular galaxies, and globular clusters, all with billions upon billions of stars. Assuming just 10 planets per star, based on our own solar system, there should be some four trillion possible planets or sites for alien life within our Milky Way galaxy alone and 400 billion trillion in our island universe. These are mind-boggling numbers. How can anyone dare say we are alone in the universe? Now, I contend that in each one of those planets, life has evolved, ranging from lower to higher embodiments. In time, some of those life forms will evolve intelligence, a technological capacity, and ultimately, a spacefaring ability. This is actually an argument for the UFO phenomenon. Now, what would they look like on those other planets? Let's take a look at just one cinematic conceptualization of eye creatures from The Crawling Eye, a 1958 sci-fi classic starring Forrest Tucker. Now let's take a look at the Rockmen from the Flash Gordon serial Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe from 1940. Hello. Yeah. I contend that both the eye creatures and rockmen might possibly exist on some planets throughout the cosmic backdrop. And by the way, I recently mentioned zeroidal life. That's life that exists in free space under zero degrees temperature and zero atmospheric pressure. Back in 1984, NASA launched a satellite that began to decay in its orbit in early 1990. It was rescued and NASA scientists discovered something unusual. It had a brownish growth on its exterior. They could not account for this. They could not determine whether it's animal, vegetable, or mineral. I contend that they've found the first evidence of zeroidal life. On Columbus Day, October 12, 1992, NASA initiated its most ambitious attempt ever to make contact with ETs. Named SETI, that's S-E-T-I, which stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, the project entails utilizing two mammoth radio antennae to sweep through space. One antenna, 112 feet in diameter, is in the Mojave Desert in California. The other, with a 1,000-foot diameter, is in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. These antennae can lock onto the entire spectrum of radio wave frequencies reaching the Earth from outer space. Supercomputers will analyze the incoming waves to determine if they form any type of non-natural pattern suggestive of a message being beamed out by an intelligent society. Basically, two types of such messages may be received. One, a deliberate periodic signal sent out to be detected by another civilization such as our own. The other, an inadvertent signal or leakage such as from alien TV video waves. Initially, the antennae are focused on 1,000 nearby stars believed to be similar to our own sun. But as I have contended, all star systems are potential habitats of intelligent life. So hopefully, the SETI project will ultimately be expanded to encompass every star in the cosmic backdrop. I'm predicting that SETI will confirm that we're not alone in the universe. Any new developments, you'll hear them right here. Next, the ghost town that spawned a ghost town up in Oregon. We sent our intrepid reporter, Dennis, up there to get the intriguing details. Take it away, Dennis. Dr. Rule, this is Dennis Michaels reporting from... Actually, I don't know where the heck I am. Oh, wait. I'll ask these kind folks of Westfall where I am. As I was wandering through town, I was thinking of Bully Creek, a deserted town I was in just yesterday. I was told there that everyone had moved away to Westfall back in the early 1900s.
Dr. Rule, I think I've stumbled on a mystery. There's no one left in this whole town. behind me was built by Mose and Lizzie Hart, a wealthy couple. Back in its heyday, this fancy home used to be one of the hot spots of Westfall. Very strange, this town seemed to have everything, but now it has nothing. I'm determined to figure out why. I've formulated another theory. What if the entire town was wiped out by a natural disaster, a disease or a famine? Of course, I realized, if the entire town had been wiped out, who would have buried them? There had to be another answer. Since no one was talking to me here, I decided to move on to the neighboring town of Harper. That's when the pieces finally began to fit. I've tracked down one of the houses that used to be in Westfall. But how did it get here, 12 miles away? The answer is simple. The people of Westfall packed up their belongings, including their homes, and moved them to Harper. But what would drive them to do this? Was it aliens from another universe? Spirits from the netherworld? Or was it that darn Bigfoot again? Actually, what it was, through this town of Harper came a huge metallic beast. Known as the Choo Choo Train. Now I believe I've solved the mystery of Westfall. What happened was the people in these parts started in Bully Creek, migrated over to Westfall, probably for the better saloons. Then when the railroad came through, they moved on to Harper. Another excellent report. Thank you, Dennis. Coming up next, intriguing evidence for reincarnation. Please stay tuned. Welcome back. Turning to Africa and the Igbo tribe of Nigeria, we have possible evidence for reincarnation. In that tribe, when a child is born, they lop off the last joint of the little left finger. Now that's not to harm the child, but rather to identify him in case he is reincarnated. They have a very high rate of infant mortality in the tribe. They believe that the children will be born again. They call these infants repeater children. And indeed, there are many cases in that tribe of infants being born without that last joint of the little left finger. Now, may I point out, we have not just evidence from the tribesmen, but also from a Dr. Stuart Edelstein, formerly of the biochemistry department of Cornell University. He's there doing research on sickle cell anemia, and he has observed such children being born. So that's possible evidence for reincarnation from the Igbo tribe. Now turning from darkest Africa to the tropical rainforests of Oregon, here we have prehistoric gardens where dinosaurs have been accurately replicated. First off, we see the amazing Brontosaurus, now Tyrannosaurus rex, with his mutated forelimbs in proper proportion to his body. Now here's the type of tropical rainforest some of those dinosaurs may well have lived in, especially during the Cretaceous period. Here we have a plant-eating Triceratops. Next up, two dinosaurs that look like actual parrots. This argues for the idea that some dinosaurs evolved into today's birds. Now a prehistoric sailfish that probably coexisted with some of these dinosaurs. A plant-eating Stegosaurus, again another gentle giant. Here's a Pteranodon who existed in all three dinosaur periods, the flying dinosaur. Here are two baby Triceratops, little baby plant eaters. And finally, the Elasmosaurus. That's one park I'd love to visit. Coming up next, Dr. Rule's World of Bizarre Medicine.
I'm a PhD, not an MD, but I've always been intrigued by the world of bizarre medicine. Let's see what's in the little black bag today. Hmm, a cold. This reminds me of the case of 47 individuals documented as having utterly uncombable hair. They cannot comb their tangled mess, and it's not their fault. Basically, it's due to two problems with their hair shafts. First, those shafts have triangular cross-sections rather than the normal circular cross-sections. And secondly, the shafts have canal-like indentations in them, making combing the hair virtually impossible. Possibly one of you out there numbers among those 47. Let's see if there's anything else in the little black bag. Hmm, a vial of botulism toxin and a medical report. This pertains to the case of a man who had a condition known as retrocolus. That's where his neck was paralyzed backward in this fashion. He had difficulty eating and engaging in other activities such as his hobby, target practice. He was given a therapeutic dosage of botulism toxin. That is given today to help certain muscular conditions such as his. It worked wonders. He's able to move his head again, able to eat normally, able to engage in target practice. Tragically, just two weeks later, he shot his son to death in an argument. This is a case of how botulism indirectly killed a man. Now when we return, the mysterious disappearance of Judge Crater and our video mailbag. Please stay tuned. Welcome back, and now for the mysterious disappearance of Judge Joseph Crater. Back in 1930, when Crater was 41, he received an interim appointment to the New York State Supreme Court. However, he paid $20,000 under the table to the Tammany Hall political machine in New York City for that appointment. However, he had a good reason. It wasn't just prestige. With that post, he was able to engage in many shady transactions involving real estate and several businesses. He amassed millions of dollars in a short period of time. During the summer, he and his wife were vacationing up in Maine, but he made numerous trips to New York City. On August 6th, he went to New York City and dined with his attorney, who was accompanied by a showgirl, Sally Lou Ritz. He told him that he had a ticket for a Broadway play and bid them adieu as he entered a taxi cab. Judge Crater was never seen again. Several possibilities. One, the mob killed him because he double-crossed him. He didn't cut them in on his shady dealings. Two, a criminal investigation into graft in the city was being conducted and they were afraid he would testify against them. Or three, he simply absconded with millions of dollars and left for Rio de Janeiro or perhaps Switzerland. Curiously, just two weeks later, that showgirl, Sally Lou Ritz, also mysteriously disappeared. Conceivably, the mob killed her to keep her quiet, or she met Judge Crater wherever he was hiding. Today, Judge Crater would be over 100 years old, but his mysterious disappearance has never been solved. It's a classic case of the disappearance of a celebrated individual, for your consideration. Now, for our video mailbag, and we have the story of a man who claims that his son's wagon was crushed by a UFO. Let's hear from Harv Klieg of Los Angeles. Roll tape. Hi, um, my name is Harv Klieg. I live right, um, right over here. And um, I just want to tell you about an experience I had about two and a half or three weeks ago late. I had walked out. I couldn't sleep. Um, and about one in the morning, I look up, there's an intense bright light and a kind of disc shape which I can't quite make, make couldn't make out and um, it seemed to kind of fall on the ground and well you can, I, I, this is what happened, I, the, my kid left his wagon out and the thing landed right on 
well, you can see it's squashed completely flat. I mean, it's completely, it's, it, you can't use it now. And, and um, I, you can't tell me that a hammer did this. So, something happened. Um, what do you think happened, Dr. Rule? Harv, I certainly think it's possible that a UFO crushed your son's wagon, but I'd like to send some specialists out there to examine both the wagon and that circular mark around it. We want to find out if you're trying to fool the rule or if this is a legitimate case. And if you at home should have any video of a UFO, ET, ghost, or anything like that, send it to us. If you have a question or answer, put yourself in front of the camcorder. If you don't own a camcorder, then put your question or answer, that is an intriguing fact you've uncovered, in writing and send it to P.O. Box 847, Glendale, California, 91209. Now, we don't promise to use what you send, but if we do, you'll have a small measure of success, and that's better than a slap on the belly with a wet trout. Now, until next time, may the power of the universe be with you.